so good morning friends today we are going to discuss about uh, stroke management in covid pandemic <clears throat> the first statement i would like to make is it is no different from the non pandemic times a stroke is a, a very big subject so i will be discussing mostly about acute ischemic stroke the recent trends and we are all used to that uh, time locked management now the tissue based clock management has come so we will discuss and i'll also discuss some cases about eight cases which will uh, give us insight into the day to day problems which we face in diagnosis also i'll make a comment on the indian stroke association recommendations of management of a stroke in covid times <clears throat> so these are the places where i worked earlier in army for about 33 years where i worked in fmc army hospital research and referral then i was trained in national hospital for neurology in neurosurgery queen square london then i was professor and hod at manipal hospital for about 4 years before coming here to bharati hospital and i am presently heading the department here so what is a stroke a stroke occurs when blood flow to the brain is interrupted by a block or a burst blood vessel when the brain tissue is uh, deprived of blood flow neurons die within minutes you will see how fast but surrounding this core of infarction is an area of brain where blood supply is compromised but not stopped this is called ischemic penumbra it is a poorly perfused but viable tissue at risk for imminent infarction so the goals of uh, acute care in the revival and rescue uh, is the revival and res rescue of the ischemic penumbra by rapid restoration of the blood flow why because blood flow carries oxygen and glucose to the neurons and that's very vital the physiology we'll discuss briefly old definition of 1960s of acute neurological insult of vascular origin which should last for more than 24 hours has been replaced by the new definition because with advances in the neuroimaging techniques we now know that strokes can be silent or asymptomatic also they may be short lived episodes of less than 24 hours but with cerebral injury so it is not a tia but a stroke earlier tia definition used to be up to 24 hours so what is the new definition cerebral infarction in brain or a retina and death due to prolonged ischemia so this neuroimaging is a vital part of the definition ich depends on imaging confirmation but we will discuss ich in a separate forum but not today so hemorrhagic stroke which is ich constitutes only 17% which is intracerebral hemorrhage subarachnoid hemorrhage intracerebral hemorrhage is 59% and subarachnoid hemorrhage is 41% whereas ischemic stroke now large artery 20% embolism 20% lacunar stroke 25% and stroke of unknown origin or cryptogenic is 30% so ischemic stroke constitutes about 8 3% and large artery is a 20% embolism also will be blocking large arteries which is also 20% and lacunar is 25% so this is the distribution and you see a heart atrial fibrillation valvular heart disease an embolic stroke a large thrombus can get dislodged and embolized and go to distal branches and occlude and deprive the brain neurons of uh, oxygen and glucose and uh, there may be atherosclerotic blocks which will block the blood flow and when thrombus occludes this then the there will be a stroke of large vessel 
see the blood supply to the brain you all know you are all intelligent people you are very important for patient care and you have all learned about the anterior circulation which is the carotid system internal carotid artery external carotid artery and of course the vertebro basilar system which supplies the blood to the brain and which is about 150 ml of blood 150 ml of csf and 1200 milligrams of uh, grams of brain carrying came at any one time inside the cranial vault and there are very many uh, large arteries which carry blood to the various regions of the brain and once they are interrupted you will get strokes and these branches are uh, only shown here to familiarize the areas of the brain which are perfused by the oxygenated blood and uh, you have to not have to remember them but you know that internal carotid artery has ophthalmic anterior cerebral middle cerebral posterior communicating anterior choroidal artery branches the vertebral has meningeal anterior spinal posterior spinal posterior inferior cerebellar artery and medullary and basilar also has the anterior inferior cerebellar artery labyrinthine pontine superior cerebellar and posterior cerebral arteries and the circle of bliss the anastomotic network at the base of the brain so with this and you know this pan field map where the leg is where your foot is where the trunk is arm hand face and tongue you see one thing here the hand representation, arm representation is very big area. So the major defect, deficit in strokes is going to be hemiparesis and also on the speech. Okay, so let's uh, just remember this Penfield map and you see the hand representation, the face representation in the brain. This is the medial aspect and this is what you are uh, seeing is a coronal plane of the brain section. This is the middle cerebral artery territory. This is the anterior cerebral artery territory and this is the posterior cerebral artery territory and you see the trunk representation, the arm representation, the face representation, the tongue representation and all these are supplied by three main branches in the brain. Cerebral neurons as I said are fully dependent on cerebral blood flow. There should be a constant supply of oxygen and glucose through blood. <clears throat> the perfusion pressure should be optimal. Any compromise in these parameters will lead to a problem. So let us learn what is normal cerebral blood flow, which is about 50 ml per 100 grams per minute. If this falls below 20 per 100 grams per minute, then there is a physiological disruption of the neuronal function and what is cerebral perfusion pressure, which is mean arterial pressure minus intracranial pressure, which is about 80 millimeters of mercury. If this falls less than 50, then ischemia and reduced electrical activity sets in. Though you look at the cerebral oxygen and glucose utilization, oxygen consumption is 3.5 ml per 100 grams per minute and the stores will last only for 10 seconds. The glucose utilization is 5 milligrams per 100 grams per minute. It lasts only for 2 minutes. So you can imagine the particular area where the blood clot obstructs the blood flow, how much damage can happen and that can be converted into the neurons that die and per stroke 1.2 billion neurons are lost. 8.3 trillion synapses are lost, 7140 kilometers of fibers are lost and an individual ages by 36 years. So this is the devastating effect of ischemic stroke. Every minute if stroke is untreated, the average patient loses about 1.9 million neurons. 13.8 billion synapses. Once again, I am emphasizing Look at this, each hour in which treatment fails to occur, the brain loses as many neurons as it does in almost 3.6 years of normal aging. That means one hour stroke not treated, the individual ages by 3.6 years. So the earlier time is brain, time is brain is a concept. So now you realize that stroke is a massive health problem and stroke is the most frequent major neurological disease about 15 million per year, the second commonest cause of death worldwide, higher mortality than most forms of cancer, 
and the leading cause of long term disability early recognition and diagnosis are the key targets it's a medical emergency i was showing you the penumbra area which is surrounding the ischemic nucleus which is irreversibly damaged and this is a penumbra the damage should be restricted and there is ongoing ischemia the brain damage is often permanent and there is high morbidity and mortality as i stated earlier now what happens if an individual suffers from a stroke most of them die within 6 months and only one fourth are living independently at home and only living at home 12.5% with help in long term care 12.5% that means the consequences are very devastating of the stroke so time is brain my dear friends the phrase time is brain emphasizes human nervous tissue is rapidly and irretrievably lost as stroke progresses and uh, that therapeutic intervention should be emergently pursued so this general call to action in acute stroke care was adapted from the its predecessor in acute coronary care where time is muscle both tracing their lineage to benjamin franklin's original aphorism time is money when we play cards so time is brain time is muscle time is money so that time is money is cards but which will be better uh, yield to the patient of uh, acute mi when you treat in time or acute stroke that also i'll emphasize in coming slides so acute stroke treatment the need is for speed pre tpa see the vessel is occluded and post tpa see the vessel is open supplying enough oxygen and enough uh, glucose to the neurons and making them survive so if you look at what i was selling this is a by acute myocardial infarction the fewer deaths and less disability see how many deaths you are preventing in disability 140 to 150 if you treat it in less than 3 hours whereas in the mi it is only 30 to 40 or 50 if you treat within 3 hours so gentlemen realize that acute stroke management is very important and they have to be given timely treatment and they are to be treated in referral hospital in stroke unit if possible otherwise you gentlemen can start the process and transfer these patients to the stroke ready hospitals so every year october 29th is celebrated as celebrated or awareness wise as a stroke day world stroke day and the world stroke organization launches campaign because one in six people will have a stroke in their lifetime so every year there will be a new slogan and they emphasize that you recognize stroke as early as possible when the signs of stroke are early weakness numbness or paralysis of the face arm or leg difficulty in speaking or understanding dizziness of or balance loss of balance loss of vision headache usually severe and abrupt difficulty in swallowing so it, if you encounter such a patient act fast and do the required things very fast so the management of stroke before 96 was condemned to varanda management of award because once stroke occurs they used to keep the patients and nothing can be done to these individuals just let them recover on their own but things have changed with ecas trial ecas nins trial then called by ecas 1 2 and 3 international stroke trial 2 3 atlantis trials all these studies have brought into the fore the issue of uh, intervention early after onset of the stroke and it went on streptokine is also was tried but because of the complications it was stopped then people tried intra arterial thrombolysis in anterior circulation in proact two trial and they also tried intra arterial uh, thrombolytic therapy in posterior circulation basilar artery up to 24 to 48 hours also in case series so the rtpa alteplase administration was to is to be administered within 4.5 hours after the onset 0.9 mg per kg body weight as a bolus 
10 percent uh, as a bolus and rest as an IV infusion over an hour with strict inclusion and exclusion criteria and this gentlemen all GPs and physicians uh, can join hands to do this and the perfect example is in Himachal Pradesh where remote areas are also uh, doctors are thrombolizing under the guidance of telemedicine with the nodal centers. Unfortunately, only 1% of the strokes get thrombolytic therapy, lack of awareness in public, lack of awareness or indifference in doctors, lack of uh, interest, delayed referral, high cost, risk taking inability and putting personal financial gains by keeping the patient with them rather than referring to higher center and doing the needful for the patient is a major hindrance. So all the GPs are requested to act fast and transfer these cases to the stroke ready hospitals as early as because for every 100 patients 13 more patients will achieve independence at three months. That is a big figure gentlemen when you consider the world over statistics. So, if you, this is called numbers needed to treat, if you do it into three hours, seven, if you treat seven, one will improve. If you treat 11, one will improve after six hours. Between three and six hours, one will improve out of 25. See the importance of time in intravenous thrombolytic therapy. So, the earlier, the better it is. But then, you always encounter problems because patients come soon after getting up from sleep. We don't know the onset of the, but then recent developments in neuroimaging have brought new knowledge about diffusion perfusion mismatch, diffusion flare mismatch. So we can time the onset with the help of the neuroimaging techniques provided you have the will to organize to transfer a wake up stroke patient to the nearby stroke center. So, summary is IV RTPA recombinant tissue plasminogen activator 0.9 milligrams per kg given within 3 hours of stroke increased the likelihood of recovery at 90 days but not at 24 hours. So, it is at 90 days, 3 months now. Hemorrhage rate is 6.4 percent plus 0.6% of placebo, but no significant difference in mortality. So, but functional recovery is good. 6.4% hemorrhage rate can be taken care of provided we are very careful in our selection. Then occluded artery can be opened with the help of a catheter based therapies. And see, this artery is occluded when a catheter is put and intravenous I mean, intra-arterial alicots of RTPA or alteplase are given, the flow will be restored and again uh, restoring the normal physiology of the brain. This is brought out in PROACT 2 trial uh, uh, where intra-arterial thrombolytic therapy was given up to 6 hours after the onset. So, the time is brain, time is brain and now up to 20 24 hours we can remove the blood clot with mechanical thrombectomy otherwise called endovascular treatment. This is the new order of the day. So stroke management has evolved over last two decades to thrombolytic therapy intravenous, intra-arterial bridge therapy, intravenous intra-arterial, then endovascular treatment and then mechanical removal of the clot and then now aspiration of the clot. So, so many things have evolved in stroke management and these are all the trials which you don't worry about seeing but you see Mr. Clean, Escape, Extend, Swift, uh, Trace, uh, Therapy, you see the time 12 hours and now it has gone up to 24 hours and so you can 16 hours, 24 hours. So, don't delay in transferring the patient to the management so, IV, this is what I was telling, diffusion weighted image and flare weighted image on MRI can show a stroke which is whether we can treat with intravenous therapy or not or whether we can do 
uh, endovascular therapy or not. So just just see that there is a scope that is called the mismatch diffusion and flare mismatch will help us in deciding this. So before that what I wanted to say is I'll show you cases and then you can understand uh, the changes of ischemic stroke on brain imaging appeared within minutes 20 to 30 minutes but the changes on another sequence called fluid attenuation recovery sequence flare sequence they appear at six hours or beyond six hours so if you see no change on flare but change on dwi then you know that you are in a time window for intra venous thrombolytic therapy or mechanical thrombectomy similarly you do a diffusion perfusion mismatch and if the mismatch is significant you can still intervene irrespective of the time of onset so what happened now what started as a time locked management now has become a tissue based management so these are the new things that have developed which we should know and all of you should be aware of uh, how to assess stroke CBRT. This is an abbreviated National Institute of Health Stroke Scale, NIH Stroke Scale, which is given here, which you sh all should practice. And one thing that does is it improves your clinical acumen, how to, and I'll give you a site where it is, uh, you can go practice and get a certificate, uh, NIH Stroke Scale certification, is done in this link and modified rank in scale certification that is your patient comes after require one month or two months and what is his disability similarly you can good practice uh, guideline certificate also for research purposes you can do all of you can do stroke research at periphery also so i also need to do it every two years and recently i also certified myself in nih stroke scale because uh, this is required in june 19 2018 and my last certification is done now i am every two to three years you have to renew your certification so another thing which has improved is we have to identify the patients who are suitable for mechanical thrombectomy at your end so this is a simple scale which has got three items whether the individual has a visual disturbance which you can do a field cut testing by the uh, visual field testing has he got a double vision is a blind new onset none or is he expressive that means he is not able language disturbance whether inability to speak or paraphrasic errors do not count a slurring of words please repeat and name two objects and receptive he is not understanding what you are asking him but he goes on talking right or mixed or none then neglect the forced gauge means both the eyes are deviated to one side or inability to track to one side unable to feel both sides at the same time unable to identify one arm ignoring one side these are neglect so Gentlemen, when a person has weakness, how do you test? You ask him to put your hands up. If there is a drift, it is mild. If severe drift, it is moderate. And of course, flaccid and severe and patient shows no way. So, van is negative that time. So, whenever an individual has weakness, please try and address these three. Uh, is the, and visual disturbance, aphasia and neglect are to be or to be seen so please all my good friends just learn these three things and identify large vessel occlusion and please send them to the stroke ready hospital and bharati hospital is now ready to do mechanical thrombectomy intraarterial thrombolytic therapy intra which has been done already but we have now introduced mechanical thrombectomy also so your stroke patients will be taken care of and you see this is there are various types of identification of uh, large vessels which i show only to create more interest the large vessel occlusion is the corner word keyword nowadays you identify it because intravenous thrombolytic therapy at times may not help uh, at times it helps so it is very important for you people because it can be treated up to 24 hours so let's see some cases i will be interesting and if you want to 
say you can uh, you can ask a question or a chart you can chat and we can do an audio problem and that should be addressed by the administrators who are organizing this okay now the cases let's see one case a 56 year old male with a history of uh, hypertension Hodgkin's lymphoma who presented with left side hemiplegia last known well is one o'clock afternoon he slumped over while at work taken to nearest hospital <clears throat> the NIHS which I was telling you is important you get your trend is 15 blood pressure 176 by 90 blood sugar is normal no history of recent surgery or bleeding <clears throat> NCCT is normal then we nowadays we have to look at the infarct related artery that means CT is one CT angiography is the next step which is very important and there is a M1 cutoff and so <clears throat> there is no contraindication to IV TPA so IV TPA was administered with a door to needle time of 45 minutes and endovascular treatment is being arranged means you have given with the help of physician there you have given under the guidance of telemedicine the TPA and now you are transferring the patient because of the TPA also you can remove the clot you can remove the clot with catheter techniques 35 minutes after the TPA he complained of severe headache so the complication of thrombolytic therapy is bleeding so the small bleed has come in the cerebellum and you see this now the question comes what next cancel EVT and admit to ICU for observation use a reversal agents and admit to ICU or proceed with endovascular treatment use reversal agents and proceed with transfer so some of these things are bothering you and if anyone wants to attempt an answer you can I'll give a second time if you want to raise your hand I will take it what would you like to do in this case that's a question which if you attempt to answer otherwise I'm going to answer your question use reversal agent and proceed with EVT so that that brings us to the notion the hemorrhage that follows intravenous thrombolytic therapy what are the types of hemorrhages we come across uh, what is a post thrombolytic symptomatic ICH and what are the precipitating factors usually the thrombolytic therapy may have a complication of ICH because of ischemic injury antiplase associated coagulopathy reperfusion injury because of the disruption of the blood brain barriers which occurs at the mean time of 13 hours you may see that it, as if it has blood so in that case we should know what are the types there are two types of hemorrhagic infarction on parenchymal hematoma that means small petechiae more confluent petechiae or hem h1 h parenchymal means less than 30 percent of the infarcted area with mild space occupying effect on neuroimaging is pH1 and more than 30 percent is pH2. So the risk of uh, TPA symptomatic ICH ranges from 2 to 7 percent. The pooled analysis of thrombolysis trials uh, showed that HI that is hemorrhagic infarction is more common but mostly asymptomatic placebo 24 percent altiplase 30 percent 32 percent that means normally also there will be a mild hemorrhagic infarction or transformation after 13 hours and parenchymal hematoma is uncommon so gentlemen don't worry about it and under our guidance you can give thrombolytic therapy and send the patient very easily the post thrombolysis ICH there is a risk of expansion but radiographic appearance will tell us and we should decide whether it is symptomatic or asymptomatic for that the patients with uh, NIH stroke scale is very important if there is a change in NIH stroke scale by four or more then it is uh, symptomatic so large hemorrhage likely high mortality regardless petechia not likely to worsen in between patients are also seen so bleeding should not you know, there are reversal agents if it's platelets which are low we can give uh, that is thrombocytopenia transfusion 
uh, reaction happens, transfusion associated lung injury, then we can encounter thrombocytopenia which can be treated with uh, single donor platelet transfusions and uh, fresh frozen plasma for patients and warfarin and you can do that and for uh, prothrombin concentrates, recombinant factor 7a, antifibrinolytic agents like amino capriolic acid, tranexamic acid or all prothrombotic and benefits are unclear but some cryoprecipitate which I am going to discuss in the next slide will tell you that uh, is helpful. Antifibrinolytic agents are considered if blood products are contraindicated or if cryoprecipitate is not available. This is our problem. What I am saying is that we can tackle this. It is uh, reversal agents derived from FFP and contains fibrinogen factor 7, factor 13 and one Willebrand factor is a cryoprecipitate. It corrects coagulopathy. 10 units uh, are to this will send fibrinogen level immediately and you give this and it decreases fibrinogen level by about 55 milligrams per dl. Uh, so 8.7 units, we are given 10 units. So it increases by 55. So it should be more than 150 milligrams fibrinogen level. So that means we are well equipped to manage any. So in this case, what happened? Posterior fossa location with pH 1 or 2, no decline in clinical examination, but uh, there is a ceiling effort which you don't bother about. Cryo precipitate was given. CT had repeated it one hour with no expansion, and the systolic blood pressure was kept less than 160. And the right middle cerebral artery syndrome is unchanged. So he was an shoot was given. EVT treatment was given. Endovascular treatment was given, and with good collateral blood flow. And you can see that this is a block, and which is going to open up with the treatment and this is open and you remember the physiology I told you about the blood glucose and simple tricks and glucose and oxygen they are supplied to the neurons and neurons are recovering the placebo area is affected and this is the clot that is removed see now what advances we made when I started my MBBS career in 83 84 nothing was done nothing we don't know MBBS I joined in 76 I started my practice in 83 but then okay there are some charts let me see what are the charts a uh, voice is loud and clear please check your network Achha, okay right that is good thank you so what happens then at discharge of this patient atrial fibrillation was detected so one of the important things is the management after stroke you have to rule out all the risk factors for the stroke and correct them especially atrial fibrillation uh, examination on discharge patient is alert oriented following all commands mild left seven of palsy and left hemiparesis nihs3 started anticoagulation post stroke day 14th for atrial fibrillation prophylaxis for stroke and so take home message from the case one is many factors need to be considered in decision to reverse TPA which we do but the solace for you is that we can manage these cases and look after the patients who are referred to our hospital best option is cryoprecipitate and one of important endovascular therapy for left large vessel occlusion can be considered if bleed is in a different vascular territory so gentlemen uh, the endovascular treatment is an option nowadays very very uh, evidence based in fact uh, the numbers needed to treat for improvement in outcome or mortality for endovascular treatment of the stroke is one of the best in the world if you treat two or three patients one will definitely improve that type of NNT what I am telling is not seen with any other disease and intervention. Let's look at the case 2. A 50 year old man with uh, no significant past medical treatment went to bed at 11 o'clock feeling normal. I told you he woke up at 4.30, went to the washroom but realized that could not walk and had headache. And the National Institute of Health Stroke Scale is 5 scored for dysarthria, ataxia and left weakness. Last known well is 6 hours prior to arrival. What is the recommendation? We should treat only within 4.5 hours. Already he slept, he got up with a stroke, we don't know what happened. What will you do? What is the guideline saying for this? The NHS 5 scored for dysarthria and hemiparesis. Not a suitable candidate for EVT 
or standard therapy. Use of imaging criteria to select ischemic stroke patients who awoke with stroke or have unclear time of symptom onset for treatment of IV place is not recommended outside a clinical trial. That was uh, the bill. That was a recommendation. So uh, please stop talking. Uh, administrator, please mute all. See, this is the image, diffusion weighted image on ADC correlation. See, we always read diffusion weighted image with ADC map and the flare is negative. This is a flare image. That means the time there is a chance for us to intervene. So 836 hours. 4 hours 6 minutes after waking up, 9 hours 36 minutes after last known well whether to treat or not to treat. Uh, NHS is rapidly improved to 1 and repeat MRI at 4 hours has shown improvement, no change. So day 5 the improved NHS 1 by the time of discharge but for mild facial droop. So, Wake up and late presenting strokes make up about 20 to 25 percent of all ischemic strokes, and out of these, 40 percent are large vessel occlusions. Just imagine, most of you will be facing this problem. Wake up uh, strokes, they are compensatory mechanisms for ischemia, collateral flow. That's how we can salvage these cases. So time-based paradigms disregard these aspects. So that means what we learned that we should be treated within four and a half hours, three hours, we should disregard. So the importance of a tissue clock is emphasized here. So the infarct evolution, this is a very important slide, gentlemen, varies widely during the first 12 to 24 hours after the stroke onset. That means some strokes may evolve, some strokes may not, this is the penumbra area. Some may evolve only this, some may be in this, some may be in this, some may be in this. So we don't know which one evolves. So there is a wide variety during the first 12 to 24 hours after stroke onset. That's why the diffusion flare mismatch has coming to work. The imaging of uh, infarct evolution tissue clock rather than, sorry, rather than time clock is more reliable than the last known well concept is delayed time window possible. So there's a chart. Let me see what it is. Uh, 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 okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So some noise I heard. That's why I said. Uh, MR witness, wake up, extend. All these trials have helped us to improve the treatment of stroke cases tremendously. Now we can treat beyond 4.5 hours provided you are aware and you got awareness to transfer them to the stroke ready hospitals like Bharti hospital. So the extended trial has shown that out of these 70% had large vessel occlusions, but none got thrombectomy. At least if you give recanalization occurs and with thrombolytic therapy. So don't hesitate and think that it is late. You please send the transfer the cases where imaging will decide whether there is still any scope for thrombolytic therapy. Now let us look at the case 3. A 53 year old physician, doctors are not immune for strokes, they also get presented with acute vertigo, diplopia, nausea and gait unsteadiness. Last known well at midnight when he went to bed, he woke at 5.30 with these symptoms, otherwise healthy no underlying medical conditions, not on any medications. So what is assessment and further plan in this individual? A tiny focus on dorsal pons with ADC correlation and this is one and there is this is the ADC correlation of this and no changes on flare. So this is what the imaging has shown. Technically out of window for RTPA being wake up stroke but in the light of new evidence, TPA was given to this physician. Treated with IV TPA, diplopia resolved after infusion, no neurological deficits at the time of discharge, and aspirin, statins, metformin for new onset diabetes. So continued. The take home message IV thrombolysis now 
very promising for extended time window as well though we require more studies but guideline updates also required but in the meantime let us treat them based on the tissue clock let's look at the case 4 a 59 year old left handed male presents with new left upper extremity ataxia he was working at his job as a lab technician when he suddenly noticed difficulty with coordination of his left upper extremity it seemed to be worse with uh, fine motor movements when it need not go away he became concerned he does not have any weakness or numbness as far as he can tell just problems with coordination last known well is 10 30 am presented to the emergency at 11 42 am past medical history none personal history remote smoking history when he was in his 20s and now he's 59 occasional alcoholic no history of illicit drug consumption the family history of hypertension is present now why i am telling this case is the decision to treat or not treat depends on the type of the job and the type of disability regardless of nih stroke scale because if scale is on less than four but he has got severe aphasia we may like to treat him so general examination showed pulse is 88 162 by 67 blood pressure otherwise normal mental status is awake alert following commands oriented to month and age naming reading intact visual fields are full extra ocular movements are intact no facial asymmetry no dysarthria left upper extremity minimal drift is seen else 5 by 5 5 power in all other extremities the sensations are intact to light touch in all four limbs there is dysmetria left upper extremity else normal finger nose and heel shin coordination test nhs is two mild drift and extremity dysmetria sorry it's right not left uh, now what happened the ct scan is head ct is normal will you give rtpa or not so you must think that it's a very small one let's go ahead and forget about this but this gentleman said i want to take treatment would you offer yes absolutely tpa and possibly endovascular treatment if there is a large vessel occlusion now the dictum is all strokes should undergo ct angiography because we don't know whether an occluded vessel has some dislodged thrombus which migrates distally occludes a vessel and gives a small infarct which is visible on ct we don't know that so to identify the infarcted vessel did it infarct related blood vessel ct angio must may we consider tpa no we would not recommend tpa but would consider endovascular treatment no tpa or evt that was a question what was bothering all the clinicians at the time or that so you should ask issues to consider are the symptoms disabling what is the patient's occupation is the risk of bleed is there what are the other comorbid conditions so depending on that which can be guided by our telemedicine patients are prefer, patient preferred tpa because he was worried about his work which consisted handling of pipettes and fine motor movements hence he received tpa after 98 minutes from last known well which is 12 8 pm and at the time and the trans thoracic echo was done as a risk stratification following the stroke uh, which showed a ejection fraction of 60 percent with no pda the vessel imaging showed mild intracranial atherosclerosis with no significant carotid stenosis hba1c is 5.6 ldl is 142 so left thalamocapsular stroke was the result subsequently follow up at three months nhs is zero much improved with no disability so mild strokes make about two-third of all strokes in population based studies definition of mild stroke nhs 5 or less so gentlemen you should know nhs i showed you the link please follow that and train yourselves but minor strokes do not consider impact on quality of life or specific deficits but in certain occupations you have to give importance to what the patient wants so overall less than five percent of acute ischemic patients receive iv tpa mild or rapidly improving stroke symptoms most common reason for lack of iv tpa in eligible patients 
31 to 43 percent of the patients arriving within three hours may not get IV TPA because they think the stroke is mild. Many major trials also excluded very mild to moderate strokes. So what I want to say is the vessel occlusion has to be established to be treated so that the damage to the brain parenchyma is very limited. The mild strokes, there is a stroke study, get with strokes and uh, this is a, uh, the uh, stroke guidelines uh, stroke study. What this study is called is GWTG stroke study. Just understand this. It assesses the safety and short term outcomes of mild strokes, which are mild, less than five, treated with IVTPA. Because all you people know major strokes. Uh, there is no confusion in your mind. If the stroke is major, you will not bother. But what we are want to stress is a mild stroke. Symptomatic ICH was low, 1.8 percent. If and if you treat them with IV TPA and mortality also is low 1.3 percent nearly one third of patients could not ambulate independently or were stable enough to be discharged to home even despite treatment with the IV TPA 73 percent had a length of stay of three plus days that means what you think mild are really not mild in the context of the recovery of the patient so these things are very important for the anger the physicians and uh, doctors to realize that uh, mild stroke post hoc analysis of data from IST3 international stroke trial 3 has shown that uh, a acute ischemic stroke patients with uh, NIHS5 treated with IV TPA within three hours of last known well were proportionately more alive, independent and scored better on standardized handicap scores at six months. Meta analysis found that IV TPA was associated with excellent functional outcome at three to six months. There is no difference in mortality however, but IV TPA is associated with significantly increased risk of uh, S uh, signal, uh, but that is symptomatic I said, which we can tackle. So there is uh, a study which is going on, PRISM study, which also looks at the question, uh, but because of the slow enrollment, it was stopped. But still, I feel that mild strokes are also to be properly investigated. So what is the take home message? The American Heart Association, American Stroke Association guidelines say that patients with mild but disabling stroke should be considered for IVTPA and that there shouldn't be any exclusion for patients with mild but disabling strokes. What are the disabling strokes? You got ataxia in the functional dominant hand, you got vision disturbances, you got speech disturbance, then go ahead and treat even there is no major weakness. For patients with non-disabling strokes, TPA can be considered depending on the risk benefit ratio. So our patient felt his stroke symptoms, though considered to be mild, were clearly disabling to him given his profession. In patients with low NHS, consider IV TPA on individual basis. Case 5. So 37 year old female, right handed female presents with uh, new onset left face and arm weakness. What was she doing? She works from home as a graphic designer, was eating lunch when she noticed her left arm felt weak and heavy. She went to the bathroom, looked at the mirror, noticed that her left face was drooped. She was brought to emergency by husband. Of note, she was found that she was pregnant several days before via pregnancy test around six weeks. Her last known well is 12, 12 p.m. and she arrived at the emergency at 1.20 p.m. well within the time frame for thrombolytic therapy. Now why I brought out this case is to tell you that for all the female patients your menstrual history and when is the last menstrual period is there any chance of pregnancy you will have to understand. She's got a hypothyroid, migraines as a teenager, but none in the last 10 years. Medications are l -troxin. occasional glass of wine, no smoking, family history is none. And physical examination showed vitals are 174, blood pressure systolic, 83 diastolic, pulse rate 77, temperature is 99. Neurological assessment, awake, alert, following commands oriented to month and age. The naming and reading is intact, visual fields are full, extra ocular movements are intact, left facial asymmetry, minimal dysarthria, left upper limb extremity with moderate drift but not too bad. That means it's not falling, else 5 by 5, the intact to touch, light touch, coordination is normal, NIHS is 4, left facial droop, dysarthria, left upper extremity drift, making the score as NIHS 4. So, 
there are two things here one is that stroke mild and she is pregnant and so it's a left side problem and non-dominant uh, hand so would you offer tpa yes absolutely tpa and possible endovascular or maybe would consider tpa or no would not recommend tpa and no tpa or EVT. these are the issues which bother us now so what we do after discussion with the patient iv tpa not given but was admitted for stroke workup and left mca tiny cortical stroke was there echo showed a ejection fraction of 55 small the uh, persistent foramen oval pf4 defect was then a trans echo <coughs> the echocardiography was done and which confirmed the pf4 proper coagulant workup was unremarkable because she is a stroke in ang doppler studies of lower limbs showed no thrombus hva1c is normal ldl is 92 perfect so she doesn't require any other intervention and at three months follow-up facial palsy dysarthria improved but mild weakness in left upper limb pregnancy, pregnancy was progressing without complications and pfo was left alone on aspirin so pregnancy and stroke stroke occurs in 34 of uh, 1 lakh deliveries of which one half are acute ischemic stroke the risk of stroke exists during entire pregnancy but peaks at term and early postmortem antepartum 49 percent during delivery 3 percent postpartum 52 percent the relative risk of ich is highest while giving birth and in the postpartum period up to six weeks time so where you have to be careful about the treatment tpa is not tetrogen teratogenic and because of its size it does not cross the placenta but it is classified as a pregnancy category C. Animal studies showed some advanced pregnancy related defects. So the main risk of TPA in pregnancy is bleeding. Though it has a short half life of 4 to 5 minutes with only 10% of concentration remaining after 20 minutes. However, pregnancy was an exclusion criteria in all RCTs of TPA in stroke. So this you keep in mind. Though so take home message retrospective case analysis and case series analyzed pregnant women treated with tpa first trimester eight cases second and third trimester two cases two symptomatic ich cases and two fetal deaths have shown and so it is not iv tpa in pregnancy in moderate to severe stroke risk and benefit so you have to assess there is no recommendation so in this case mild disability persists it is necessary to document all conversations with the patient so you explain to them that there is no use because you may be taken to task afterwards if you don't explain that a pregnancy is a contraindication they may ask no no why you didn't give treatment so that's how I say let's look at the case six 88 year old female with right sided weakness we got two more cases a language difficulty uh, unclear history of cardiac arrhythmia and hypertension who presented after new right weakness and language difficulty there was, she was at McDonald's eating breakfast with friends when she slumped over and had trouble speaking at 9 51 a.m. she seemed to improve slightly but never returned to baseline she did not want to go to hospital so friends walked her home symptoms worsened at home she arrived at 11 5 last known well is 9 51 a.m. and she came at 11 5 history of erythemias hypertension osteoarthritis a breast lumpectomy benign metoprolol diltiazem ibuprofen alendronate and gabapentin were his medications no family history no tobacco or alcohol independent for activities of daily living vital parameters blood pressure look at 203 by 114 heart rate 71 and lying in bed with mild distress, awake, alert, not able to uh, express orientation or to select from choices, follows one or two simple commands, unable to read or name or to select from choices, occasional word, there is a right homonymous, hemianopia, gaze is midline, unable to look left and right, moderate right facial droop, dysarthria, right upper extremity weakness, fails to bed, but little moment noted, right lower extremity weakness unable to sustain five seconds lift and left side able to hold anti-gravity without drift these are the components which you learn when you do nih stroke skill training with the draws to painful stimuli equal in all four limbs unable to follow commands nihs is 15 and these are the various uh, denominators under which the nihs is calculated 
the resident who saw the patient in the emergency recognized left ventricular a uh, left vessel a large vessel occlusion syndrome and ordered a concomitant cta the ct angiography has shown proximal left m2 occlusion there is a dense mca clot on ct scan which you can see here this is the ct scan showing a clot no evidence of other acute intracranial findings the ct angiogram showed a left m1 or m2 occlusion subsequently so this is got hyperdense mca sign which all should able to recognize in stroke cases would you offer tpa same questions bother us whether to do or not to do iv tpa push was given and she was planned for endovascular treatment iv tpa given 162 minutes after last known well and tc3 recanalization obtained at 12:54 pm after one pass in the in the catheter angiogram uh, with stent retriever and icu for monitoring she was admitted that means she underwent evt and a stent retriever was passed and there was a recanalization anticoagulation started on day 5 post stroke MRS and follow up is too ambulant with what finding difficulty but able to communicate occupational speech and physiotherapy are recommended and she staged so MRI showed that uh, subsequent MRI showed scattered embolic infarct echo showed 35 to 40% of ejection fraction no shunt there is a loop recorder nowadays you can attach a loop recorder for the patient and monitor for atrial fibrillation which can be paroxysmal and episodic these loop recorders can be kept up to 7 days external loop recorder up to 30 days internal loop recorders are also which are put under the skin can be there up to 6 months why because <clears throat> the cryptogenic strokes atrial fibrillation paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is a common thing so if you identify that these individuals can be placed on warfarin or novax and uh, hb a1c in this case is 6.1 ldl is 102 so iv tpa yes or no before evt but in favor of iv tpa pre thrombectomy early reperfusion at first angiography run is 5 to 10% that means thrombus is softening the chances of reperfusion when evt is not possible suppose the technically the individual is not able to do the doctor is not able to do then at least iv tpa works reperfusion of distal occlusions after evt are also taken care of if you give iv tpa what are the points against bleeding and coagulopathy tandem lesions extra and internal could necessitate further procedures and immediate antiplatelet therapy so that will be delayed if you give anti iv tpa so there may be migration of the distal thrombus and increasing fragility of thrombus there may be a delay in endovascular therapy if you so there is a debate in this but the essence is iv tpa and endovascular therapy are the order of the day the take home message iv tpa is standard of care and to be started earlier than endovascular therapy one meta analysis showed complete recanalization of m1 that is major occlusions in 21% within 3 hours after iv tpa so more than 80% of the large vessel occlusion cases selected for evt received iv tpa so iv tpa is must current guidelines recommend pre treatment with iv tpa prior to evt for large vessel occlusion so if we diagnose the case at o end with your physician then we'll order you to give so case 7 last but one case is a short case and uh, you can see that 71 year old right hand lady with a history of lung adenocarcinoma underwent left upper lobe lobectomy and was on chest tube and post op eighth day at 1 am she developed a witnessed onset of left hemiparesis with nih score of 11 nccd is negative 4 hours after the onset at emergency normal blood pressure and uh, she came to emergency normal blood pressure and blood sugar and whether we same questions it will bother us and she received iv tpa after 4 hours 29 minutes and the improvement is very well seen initially the occlusion was there but the reperfusion takes place subsequently and the area is salvaged see the volume is less than 30% 22 ml that means they did a diffusion perfusion mismatch 
and so the salvageable tissue mismatch volume is 94 ml in this case so ct angiography perfusion study was done and there is a perfusion mismatch of more than 94 ml so he she was given cerebral angiogram subsequently was negative the next day neurological examination showed left hemiparesis with nhs3 she was transferred to uh, the, after three months the mrs is one and nhs is zero so uh, clinical course after the intervention ct is negative the improvement is very rapid so the MRI brain has shown only a small infarct in this case. So left a uh, large vessel occlusion, major surgery 14 days back did not prevent us. If we don't do, then this would have been the case of this. So there is a PROAC 2 trial which has shown that intra-arterial therapy is a good thing. So we can consider in the uh, for recanalization, intra-arterial therapy is an option available because recanalization rates with intra-arterial 66% versus 25% in controls and the outcome is 40% improvement in MRS less than 2 in patients treated with uh, intra-arterial therapy as compared to 25% in controls. So, Early recanalization is seen in 33% in large vessel occlusion, so TPA has to be given. So, recent major surgery, less than 14 days. What is the take home message? Use of intravenous alteplase in carefully selected patients presenting with acute ischemic stroke who have undergone a major surgery in the preceding 14 days may be considered, but the potential. Increase the risk of surgical site hemorrhage should be weighed against the anticipated benefits of reduced stroke related neurological deficits class 2b and level of evidence C. So that is a chance that we may intervene. So the, the, the actually the recommendations of uh, the uh, current recommendation is a relative exclusion criteria. This surgery is relative earlier no major surgery in the previous 14 days but now it is a relative contraindication that means we are able to thrombolize so the 2015 updated stroke guidelines are uh, everybody you have to read them and acute ischemic stroke receiving IV TPA within 4.5 hours of onset is the recommendation but endovascular therapy with a stent retriever if they meet all the following criteria the pre-stroke MRS score should be 1 occlusion of the internal carotid artery at proximal MCA that M1 age more than 18 years NAHS more than 6 aspect that is CT aspect score which I am not touching treatment can be initiated within 6 hours of onset in 2015 guidelines but that thing also has changed subsequently with the onset of a diffuse 3 trial it has come up to 16 the update uh, of that happened subsequently 18 2018 the guidelines have changed now and they said that you can give treatment up to 16 to 24 hours last case of uh, our presentation 59 years with no past medical history of uh, lost known well at 12 am collapsed five minutes late on awakening complaint of chest pain reached emergency so such cases are always dicey because neurological examination showed language intact left homonymous hemianopsia right gaze preference that means a major stroke left hemiplegia and positive neglect did not recognize his hand nhs is 21 and there is a major stroke uh, ecg showed st elevation that reversal later and chest x-ray is normal ncct did not show at the time any evidence of stroke except the doubt here but one hour after onset at emergency uh, would you recommend now we should not recommend IVTP for such cases because this individual CT chest has shown a dissection because he had a chest pain and a elevated ST elevation on the ECG. So, aortic dissection is very, very dangerous and we should not treat. So, symptom is very important at the onset. Aortic dissection, cervicocephalic arterial dissections, or it is not to be given, is not recommended, is potentially harmful. So that ends our cases and the, there is a consensus statement issued by Rohit Bhatia et al of the recommendation of acute stroke management during COVID-19 pandemic. There is no difference. First, history taking, whether he is exposed to anybody who is known to have COVID, 
whether he is coming from June, whether he has got any history of fever, whether he has got history of breathlessness or sore throat, and is he in high risk category? What we made a policy is to do a CT chest for all the stroke cases, and out of the 30 cases of stroke, uh, which CT chest was done, 18 showed evidence of uh, COVID-19 infection in lungs. That means you have to do inflammatory parameters, that is D-dimer, LDH, ESR, CRP, and also CT chest, and categorize them high risk group or is already positive. So ideally you should have a dedicated CT scan to do, otherwise you have to sanitize, you have to put mask, you have to take care and spacing to be done. So this is available on the net, you all can read, but thing is that one third present with CNS features in COVID nowadays. So you, they can be ischemic strokes, they can be hemorrhagic strokes, but strokes are strokes. What I have seen from March to this, the only things that are reporting to emergency apart from others are only strokes. We are only seeing strokes in pandemic area and various types of ischemic strokes are coming and we are managing with intravenous thrombolytic therapy. The ICH cases are managed effectively. So the protected stroke code uh, is uh, the concept which refers to the concerns related to preparedness for managing acute stroke and preventing healthcare workers and other patients from getting exposed to the virus. We practice this practice protected and so we have a clear cut flow chart of what is to be done in the cases of a stroke. That's not uh, uh, your purview, but what I can stress is that everything will be taken care of a screening COVID negative, COVID suspect, COVID positive, all will be uh, done and the routine hospital based protocol management is executed, but should be referred to COVID designated hospital if you are COVID positive cases. So acute stroke management, same acute imaging, IV thrombolysis, endovascular treatment, standard recommendations for managing stroke as per American Heart Association guidelines of 2019, Indian Stroke Association guidelines and national stroke guidelines need to be followed and there are recommendations about uh, stroke green pathway, separate pathway for stroke pre-designated, separate pathway if it is feasible pathway for stroke patients strictly separated from routine emergencies, consultation rooms and these are the administrative problems, a general CT machine should be used and the area sanitized after the procedure by the standard protocols. So this is same, there is nothing, no change, the no change in the management and what I described with the cases, same thing will be followed only with preparedness that we may uh, be exposed to an individual with stroke which COVID is not diagnosed. So you have to be careful right from the beginning. If a COVID positive patient is admitted in hospital, he may develop a stroke. Or a stroke comes to the hospital, he may have an underlying COVID infection which is not detected. So the physicians, the GPs, the physicians, the neurologists, and the emergency and critical care people all have to be careful to take into consideration the fact that there may be uh, report the uh, COVID positivity and uh, so intubation techniques, surgical techniques all have been laid out and the recommendations which I am not going to uh, go through but important thing to stress is test reports of uh, SARS-CoV-2 in COVID-19 suspected should be made available on a high priority to confirm the final status and uh, the stroke unit Protocol in these cases also is same, nursing care bundle is same, control of blood pressure, prevention, treatment of medical complications, positioning and bed sore prevention, DVT prophylaxis, swallow assessments can be carried out, monitor for any neurological worsening and complications, interdepartmental teleconsultation and appropriate secondary prevention should be started. And there is no change in rehabilitation also must be managed in the designated hospital, uh, hospital as per guidelines, but if it is not there, we can segregate and all suspected patients should be managed in the uh, stroke unit designated, inpatient unit or area designated for that, so that the spread of the infection is minimized. And uh, the what happens is the stroke care in the 
uh, hospital gets affected if there is a fear but with precautions uh, these patients can be really solved we have done and these people have will come out because understand one thing this is a pro coagulant state covid 19 and it causes a thrombus which is less less hard i mean sprayable thrombus which can be easily lysed so if you give thrombolytic therapy the large vessel occlusions which appear as a pole of string appearance and ncct are uh, uh, diffusion weighted image will disappear very soon and the recovery will be fast so covid 19 cases with stroke uh, may have better outcome when compared to other large vessel occlusions the surgical precautions are also the, we have to be taken because we have to refer them for decompressive hemicraniectomies and these are also listed in the guidelines which uh, i'm not going to touch much rehabilitation simply has to be very daily medicine aided uh, rehabilitation should be practiced because the rehabilitation specialists have to go close to the patient who is positive but you can still execute rehabilitation with precautions via telemedicine or whatsapp or whatever means of uh, communication so that's all from my side thank you very much for your attention any questions we have taken one hour 15 minutes talk please ask if there are any questions